Hello everyone, can you hear me? Test, test. Um, yeah, first of all, I just want to uh, start off by thanking uh, Joan uh, for the warm welcome and I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Song East and Astanich uh, for uh, allowing us to conduct our, our work here tonight. And uh, I'd also like to thank all of you guys for showing up. Um, I didn't expect there to be this, uh, this kind of turnout. There's probably more people here in this crowd than there is in my community, Clem too, so, uh, so it's nice to see. Uh, I just thank the organizers uh, just for creating the space to allow us to talk about bears. And anyone who knows me uh, knows I, I love to talk about bears. So any chance to get some ears, I'll uh, gladly talk about them. So, um, so I guess just to formally introduce myself, my uh, traditional name is Mubas Claw. Uh, which in my language means white bear, and uh, that was given to me by my elders, uh, partly because of the work I do, uh, but also because of the responsibility that my community uh, has bestowed upon me to carry out the work uh, for protection of bears and their habitat. So uh, I've been doing a lot of work with bears over the last uh, number of years. Um, just to give you a bit of background where I'm from, uh, I come from a very small community on the central coast of British Columbia, uh, a community called Plum 2. Um, which is home to two different groups called the Kirisu, who are part of the Sinchian language family. And that stands from uh, Clem 2 on the central coast of British Columbia all the way up to Prince Rupert area. It's kind of the Sinchian area. Uh, and then the other nation is the Heihakes Nation, uh, who mostly lived on the mainland, so occupied places like Kainok and Muscle Inlet, which are quite well known for bears. Um, just to, some of you guys don't know about the Great Bear Rainforest, to where it is. Uh, it basically stands from kind of the top end of Vancouver Island, and it goes all the way up to the Alaska border, including Haida Gwaii. Quite an extensive community, and uh, we're part of several different groups. One of them, uh, a group called Coastal First Nations, uh, which is an alliance of, of nine First Nations communities that uh, allow us to do a lot of our work, especially around resource management and things like protection for bears. So that's one of the groups I work for as well, uh, which is the Bear Working Group. Um, and which allows me to be here also to talk about bears on behalf of the Coastal First Nations as well. So just to give you in a bit of an idea, this is kind of a, a snapshot of the, one of the areas. This is my traditional territory uh, right in the central coast of British Columbia. So this would be the traditional territory of both uh, the Kittisu and the Heihei's people. And uh, in these areas there's you know, quite a vast amount of uh, different really important areas, whether it was for fish or for uh, you know, deer, mountain goats, bears, um, and it's one of the last largest intact temperate rainforest left on the planet. So we live in a, in a pretty special area uh, and we know that. And we know that in the 90s it was under threat. You know, as you know, a lot of companies and the provincial government was issuing tags for people to come in and, uh, and start doing a bunch of forestry in our territory. So, we had all these logging companies started to move in and that created a lot of controversy amongst First Nations communities and also amongst environmental groups and stakeholders that really want to do a lot of work in terms of protecting uh, these areas and protecting them uh, for the food resources or protecting the important habitat that was there. Uh, so it led to a lot of our communities, uh, again stakeholders and environmental groups to start developing and hashing out uh, the very first land use plans on the coast. So my community, Klemtu, uh, was one of the first communities that were able to develop a land use plan. Um, and out of that land use plan, we wanted to protect a lot of these areas, so we started to you know, have a lot of discussions and come out with uh, a number of areas that we wanted to set aside as protected areas and protect those old growth uh, forests and all the resources within them. So this is a snapshot of my area here uh, in our traditional territory. Uh, we set aside about 48% of my traditional territory in protected area, and that's huge for my community. Um, and as you know, a lot of these remote coastal communities are very dependent, or used to be very dependent on uh, extractive type of industries, whether that was forestry or whether that was fishing. Uh, so in my community, we essentially chopped off a huge economic arc for ourselves in terms of not having access to some of these forestry opportunities. And, uh, and that was okay for our community, because uh, we're not really foresters, we're not into mining, uh, but we still need to generate revenue. And as you know, in these remote areas, I and mean, where I live in Plumtu, there's no road access. Uh, you can only get there by boat or plane. Uh, so for us, we needed to start looking at other ways of generating some revenue, um, you know, in the community. So we really tried to look at uh, a bunch of different options of, of what we can do. So that's when I started. Um, I started back in 2000. I was about uh, 18 years old when I was hired to start trying to develop uh, an ecotourism operation in my community. Uh, and that was a fairly new concept in my community. We didn't really know what to expect from ecotourism. And I remember the very first few meetings that we had, we, you know, we had questions like, are we going to have all these tourists come into our community and buy out all the food in our band store? Are they going to buy out all our 
fuel at the fuel station? Are we selling our culture? Um, you know, those are some major questions that we had to answer. Um, but the community also started to recognize that we needed to diversify our economy. We couldn't depend on resource extraction as a source of business anymore, and we need to, to look at these new opportunities. Um, so that's when I was brought on. Uh, Evan, who's here tonight, he hired me way back when I was about 17 or 18, and uh, we started to build this tourism business together. Um, and when we first started, you know, it was uh, we looked at a lot of different avenues of, of what tourism could be in the community, and we thought cultural tourism was the way to go. Uh, we thought, you know, we have hundreds and hundreds of cultural sites in the in the territory. Uh, we have everything from you know some old totem poles uh, to old big houses. Um, so we thought that was the way to go, and really try to market that. But we found out very quickly that there just wasn't a huge market for it. Some people were very interested in it, um, and. Uh, <coughs> So some, you know, so we, we had to focus on diversifying that a bit more. So we got involved in kayaking instead of doing kayak tours. Uh, we did that for five years, kayaking on the territory, and uh, we found out very quickly that kayakers are the cheapest people on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a lot of them would bring their own kayaks, they bring their own food, and uh, sometimes they'd be doing these tours to break even. So. We really want to start diversifying that even a bit more. So we started doing other things like doing tours for small pocket cruisers that were going through the territory. Um, but just like our tourism wasn't quite there yet. So we needed to invest in the infrastructure and when we were start up, you know, trying to start up our business, we just didn't have the resources. But through some of the Great Bear Rainforest Agreements, we were able to bring some additional revenue um, and allow us to start looking at expanding our operation. And that's something that really the wholesale market really wanted to do. And back in those days, we had our company was actually called Plenty Tourism. Back in those days, and we really wanted to shift our brand, and people were really interested in bears. So that's what we really wanted to focus on: is how to start getting people to this region around bears. And uh, it was uh, so. One of the things we started to do is we wanted to look at investing in a lodge. So we started to number one, I guess, we brand our operation to Spirit Bear Lodge. We built ourselves a, a nice hotel, um, and that can accommodate uh, 24 people now today. And just really focus on growing this business and, and, and start to train a lot of the community members, uh, you know, whether that was uh, training new guides, training new board operators, training new uh, hotel staff or cooks in the community. Um, and it's been extremely positive. And today, uh, well, I guess as of last year, we just broke a million dollar mark. Uh, we employ about 45 people in the community. Um, and now it's the second biggest industry in our community. Um, so it's really grown a lot and, and it's taken a bit longer than we hoped, but it's now at the point where it's uh, you know, starting to generate some good numbers for the community and increase some, some local employment. So uh, you know, we're quite happy about that. So, so one of the things, you know, obviously people from all around the world um, are really excited about coming, having the opportunity to view bears. And we get people from all over the place that have come from all these different countries and some people say, well, we just don't have wildlife anymore. We used to have grizzly bears, we used to have all this from wildlife, but they've lost it all, whether that's through deforestation or through you know just loss of habitat uh, and things like that. So I think for us, the Great Bear Rainforest is one of the last strongholds uh, for bears. You know, it's one of the only areas you can get these large intact uh, temperate rainforests uh, you know on the planet. So um, and there's certainly uh, I don't want to say a ton of bears in the area, but there's certainly more than a lot of other places, and we're quite uh, lucky to have these. Um, and we spend quite a bit of time with these bears. I mean, this bear in particular, we spent uh, when he. We spent time with him. We first met him when he was first born as a yearning cub, um, and this is his third year. The mother just pushed him away, and uh, this little cub just followed us everywhere he we went. Like we his mother, so we really got to know these bears. And some of these bears, you know, we're quite lucky that we get to spend. Uh, in some cases, I've watched some bears for 12 or 15 years and, and watched them grow and, and as cubs and, until they have their own cubs, and sometimes two or three sets of cubs. So we get to know some of these bears pretty uh, pretty well. Um, we also have another bear in the area, uh, which is a subspecies of black bear. This is the Cody species uh, of black bear, um, which is quite neat because a lot of these, in, in these areas, uh, we have these black bears could potentially produce spirit bears, and both parents have to have this recessive gene um, that, could, that produces a spirit bear. Uh, and these bears have been genetically isolated to the islands. Um, that's allowed this, uh, this spirit bear to thrive there, uh, you know, a lot of these areas. So. Um, and then, of course, the spirit bear um, is a very special bear in our community, uh, both culturally uh, and, and for economic purposes as well. I mean, uh, the, the, in the Central Coast, 
Uh, we have the highest concentration of spirit bears in our territory. Um, and it's really the only place in the world that you're going to find spirit bears is right here in British Columbia. Um, so, and we just, uh, we've seen a lot of challenges over the years, uh, whether that's through uh, trophy hunting or whether that's through deforestation um, and just losing more and more uh, of their habitat. And just a bit about, you know, me and my culture, I guess kind of started out with tourism. I remember when I was first hired in uh, 2000, um, Evan, who's here tonight, actually uh, told me to go out and look for a spear bear because I used to work for a fisheries program before I worked for tourism, but he sent me off to go look for a spear bear and I just, I never even heard of a spear bear, um, you know, before, actually when I was hired on the job. Um, so I went to go look and I just thought, there's no way there's this, this white bear walking out of the territory, so I had no idea what he was talking about. So I went up to go and look for this bear and I thought, I kind of, you know, didn't think it existed. Um, and anyways, uh, as I was out there, uh, this white bear basically walks right in front of me and lays down and he's eating this fish. And, uh, you know, the forest opens up and the sun comes out and, and there's blood all over his face. And it was just this really magical moment. And I just, you know, and I was shocked. Like, how come I, you know, my elders had never talked about spirit bears? So I went back to the community and was asking them, how come, you know, we've never heard of this? And, and a lot of them just didn't want to talk about this because during times of the fur trade, they didn't want to uh, bring any attention to it. They were worried that people would hunt out these bears, and uh, so it was a really special animal uh, in my community. And then they started to tell stories about the spear bear. And in my community, we have a legend of the spear bear, and in our culture, uh, Gu Wei, who is the raven, uh, he's the creator of the world, and he also created the Ice Age. And as the ice started to melt, uh, he wanted something uh, to remind himself of the Ice Age, so he decided to turn every tenth black or white and set them on Princess Royal Island and that area will be protected for the spirit bears. And so it was a really special animal and the elders just didn't want to see it uh, you know, hunted in, in any way and, and so they tried to do whatever they can to protect it. So, so that was really interesting to, you know, to learn about as we started. And of course people come for a lot of different, you know, a lot of other things as well. We have a million bald eagles and I know a lot of Americans especially get really excited when they see the bald eagles. <laughs> Um, Central Coast or the Great Wolves uh, are certainly very special as well and sometimes we see packs up to 20 wolves in the territory. Um, so these are quite unique animals and sometimes you can watch them fish, uh, you know, and that's still some, certainly uh, something that people are learning more about now is how much uh, salmon, uh, you know, these are actually, well, there's the only place that I guess these wolves eat salmon, so which is kind of neat. Um, and obviously we try and incorporate as much as we can in terms of, uh, you know, cultural tourism, really getting the community involved. And my community said our business is not just about money. Our business is about uh, the community. It's making sure that we respect the environment, make sure that we minimize our impacts out there, and make sure that the community is involved and that they're learning their, their stories, they're learning their culture, they're learning their territory. So that was really important that we were able to develop this and implement this amongst the community. Uh, we also have an increasing whale population. Um, as you know, a lot of the uh, humpback whales or killer whales, a lot of them were all hunted out. but through some protection, well, there's been an increase in the whale population, uh, which has been great over the last few years, so that's been uh, growing in the territory. <coughs> so, as we started to develop this tourism business, uh, we started to run into a number of challenges as we were trying to, to build this business. Um, trophy hunting was a major issue. Um, uh, lack of enforcement from provincial agencies, uh, ecosystem-based management, and I'll get into some detail on some of these things. But I just had the opportunity to travel around to all these different forums and try and promote tourism, and whether that's through wholesale markets or I work a lot of different groups and travel trade shows and, and go all over the place. And I see very much that the province goes out and promotes bears, and it's all over their uh, campaign ads, whether it's, uh, and they market this as supernatural British Columbia. And, uh, you know, they, they have one of the most iconic animals, and they the spirit bear. They use as one of their logos and, and protection. Um, and I think there's just a lot of things that people don't know that happen right here in their backyard. Um, and one of the major issues that we start to see uh, is trophy hunting. Is, uh, this is a major issue. So as we're out there trying to build a tourism business, uh, you could be in, a, in an area competing with trophy hunters. Um, and so that was a major issue. So we, there's basically two uh, hunts that happen. There's one in the spring and there's another one in the fall. And some of them are open for about a, a month to two months where these guys, can, people from overseas can come in and come and blast all these bears. And uh, there's been several times throughout my career that I've uh, witnessed some of these things. And I remember the very first time was actually back in uh, 2005. Um, I remember I spent about five or six weeks with this one black bear 
And this black bear was living in an area where there was uh, mostly grizzly bears. And, and normally these, these bears don't do so well uh, if there's uh, grizzly bears in the area. So this black bear knew this. And every time that we went there as a group, this black bear would get really excited to see us. And he would just grab his fish and he would be excited like a dog. And he would just kind of come over and eat his fish right in front of us. And we just had some amazing viewing. And he hung around us all day because he knew that the big male grizzly bears wouldn't come close to us. So he would lay down and just eat his fish. And, and we just had some amazing viewing. Um, and I remember one day we were pulling out. Uh, uh, we were pulling out of that area, and as we were pulling out, um, we passed a, a boat. It was a punt, and it was an open boat. And uh, these guys were all dressed in camel gear. They had tripods on the boat. And uh, I thought for a minute, you know, trophy hunters. And I thought there's no way these guys are trophy hunters um, because I just didn't think they would be up in my area on the central coast on an open boat and not far away. So I just I kind of dis disregarded it. And we left. We ended our day. I went back to our community. Uh, and a few hours later, um, our Coastal Guardian Watchman program came in shortly after behind me and said uh, there was a trophy hunter that was in muscle and he just went in and shot those bears. He went in and shot that black bear and he shot that grizzly bear. And then he broke into our cabin and he had these two dead bears laid out in front of our cabin. And I was pee right off uh, that I heard about this. Um, and then I tried to get access so someone could lend me the boat so I could get up there, but nobody really wanted to give me the boat because I think they probably knew what, I, what, what happened. Um, but I was furious, and I went back to my uh, band council the next day, and, and I was just, you know, I was pretty young back in those days, and I went back to the band council and said, well, how the hell do we allow this in our territory, you know, as First Nations governments? Uh, you know, how do we still allow this practice to happen? We go out there and promote tourism in this pristine wilderness, and then we still allow these kind of activities to happen in our backyard, and I said, something's got to change. Um, and then that's really what I meant. Raincoast, we really started to work with Raincoast a lot more, and I heard that they were making some efforts to purchase out, uh, purchase this particular license that this guy had, which was a huge territory. Um, so I knew I really wanted to get involved and, and, and help uh, support that, and, and as one of the ways of ending uh, trophy hunting in the Great Bear Rainforest. So, um, and that's when we started working a bit more. Um, so that was just one of the issues around trophy hunting. Um, another one of the issues is resident hunting. So as British Columbian residents, uh, people can come into our territory and they can buy a black bear tag for $20. Uh, you can buy a, a grizzly bear tag for $80. Uh, then you can come out there and shoot these bears. Um, and for us, that's really concerning because we have black bears in our territory which people can come and hunt and that bear could be carrying that recessive gene that produces a spirit bear. Uh, so for us, that could really limit spirit bears which already there's fairly low numbers already. I hear guesstimates that there's 400 of these spirit bears out there, uh, but between Clump 2 and Hartley Bay, I would say we don't see more than 50 of these bears, and we cover almost every river. We cover well over 100 rivers in our territory, uh, just in Clump 2 area, and uh, we don't see anything close to 400. Um, so, but another issue is uh, through resident hunters, they can come in and shoot grizzly bears, and I know uh, resident hunters promote themselves as conservation organizations and say that uh, you know, it's a sustenance hunt. They come here and they hunt uh, for sustenance purposes. And we respect that as First Nations people. That's what our culture is based on, to say that if you're going to hunt, you should use everything. You should eat everything. Uh, but here's a guy who came up in our territories. And this was actually documented by one of our Coastal Garden Watchman program. This guy came up uh, with the intent, saying that he was a resident hunter. And he came and shot this grizzly bear. And he uh, shot it and chopped off his head and chopped off his paws. And then he left the rest of it there to rock. And uh, he just took the, the head for a, uh, a trophy. Um, and uh, yeah, just, it was uh, really unfortunate. So we, uh, you know, I guess you know, the watchman from Bella Bella documented all of this stuff. And uh, the guy who shot it was actually an NHL hockey player. That was the Clayton Stoner incident that happened uh, a few years ago. Um, and it was pretty crazy because we actually went to that place where we hunted this bear just before Clayton Stoner had dropped there, hung up this massive sign that said, no trophy hunting in the Great Bear. And uh, this guy walked right by our sign and shot this bear and uh, again tried to say uh, he was a resident hunter. Um, in this case, it was illegal. He didn't have proper tags because number one, he wasn't a British Army <coughs> resident anymore because he moved down to the U.S. and played for the Minnesota Wild and now uh, the Mighty Ducks. Um, but that's something that we deal with on a regular basis, that trophy hunters can still come in and shoot these kind of bears. So that's another major issue that we still deal with in the Great Bear Rainforest. Uh, deforestation is still a major issue and I know that there's been some work around uh, developing what some people call ecosystem-based management and that's supposed to be logging a lot different so no more clear cuts um, and, 
and really getting away from kind of conventional type of logging. So no more road systems, trying to look at how you log in a bit more. Um, but everyone has a different interpretation of what ecosystem-based management is. If you go talk to the provincial government, their difference, of, you know, their opinion of EBM is very different than the forest companies. If you talk to the forest companies, it's very different from First Nations. Um, so when I started to do a bit of work around this, I started to find out while well, visual quality corridors, for instance, are not really even considered as a part of the ecosystem-based management. So uh, you know, you can get huge ball spots in mountains, and it just to me uh, defeats the purpose of of promoting this you know amazing wilderness that we have. So that's something that we're trying to look at doing is addressing these kind of issues and making sure that we're keeping those areas intact. Um, and I still think you can do forestry, I still think you can do sustainable forestry, but just changing the landscape. And so we told our community that, you know, because we also uh, have a forest company that we would lead the way in terms of what ecosystem-based management is going to look like in our territory. So, uh, but we want to make sure that things like bear habitat is protected, marbled mirrorlet habitat, tailed frogs, northern goshawk, all of those things, all of these big animals, and these are some of these are on the endangered list now, so we've got to make sure and address and, and protect uh, these areas and make sure that they have a place. Um, and obviously salmon, ha salmon, salmon habitat is really important. And all the work that we do, we want to make sure that we look at this holistic view of management. And, uh, if there's no salmon, there's no bears. And that's very clear that, you know, the elders always tell me about this. Because I do a lot of bear work, and the elders always say, Doug, you can't talk about bears unless you're talking about salmon. So please get to work on salmon. So um, <laughs> next year, that's our project. We're getting into salmon research. <coughs> but I always remember when I first started in tourism, back in uh, 2000, and I remember going into this one river, um, there was an amazing system called Coots Inlet, and I remember in this, I was in this system uh, with one of my elders, and, uh, and as I got in there, we started to go up the river, and in the middle of the river, it was just all black, full of salmon in the middle. And I remember saying, holy, you know, what, what, you know, there's a ton of fish here. And, uh, and I was just amazed at how many fish were in there. And this elder grabs me, and he straightens me out, and he said, Doug, this is a fraction of what it used to be. He said, when I was here back in my day, in my younger days, he said, you could walk across their backs. The salmon was so thick that you can get across the other side of the river. And he said, so this is a fraction that it used to be. He said, if you come in this system, you know, a long time ago, he said, there was hundreds of eagles, tons of bears, tons of wolves. And he said, that system, this is completely changed and completely different from um, what it was in my time. And so from that day, from 2000 until now, I've seen huge decline in that area. And I just see, a fraction of what it used to be in my time from 2000 until now. So I can't even imagine what my elder has seen in his lifetime. Um, but a lot of time we get, you know, DFO scientists that come in and say, well, yeah, it's pretty good, the numbers are fairly healthy. But if you go look at the historical numbers for some of these areas, places like Coots Inlet used to have about 80,000 fish in those areas, and now some of those systems are down to about five or 6,000 fish. So I think shifting baselines are something that we need to look at, need to address, and somehow we need to deal with, because some of these systems just haven't been able to recover. And through all of our interviews with our community members, they'll be able to tell you exactly the day that they've seen that change. They'll say, we remember the day that DFO opened up these areas and fished up these areas right to the mouth of the river, and those areas haven't been able to recover. So they can tell you exactly what day, what month, uh, you know, when those things happen. So these are the sort of things that, you know, these are just a few of the things. I can go on and on forever on a million different issues. Um, but again, I think just a lot of things that people don't realize that you know, these are some of the issues that go on um, right in our backyard. So this is, um, I was supposed to have a video. Unfortunately, I couldn't get it to work. Um, as it have a new, I have a new laptop and, and we just switched over. So anyways, I couldn't get it, but I've been trying to tackle a lot of the issue around uh, trophy hunting in the Great Bear Rainforest. And I remember in 2010, um, I came down to Vancouver to actually promote our tourism business. So I, said, I was still a tour guide back then. And I came down to promote our tourism business. And during the opening of the Olympics, I don't know how many of you guys remember, they actually had this big bear mm -hmm. in the middle of the mm -hmm. opening ceremony. Mm -hmm. And I think it was supposed to be a polar bear, but some people must, you know, mistook me, I guess, thought it was a spear bear. And I was like, okay, I'll take it as a spear bear. That's fine. <laughs> so I'm wearing a small spear bear. But so some people were asking me about spear bears. And I had the opportunity to talk about bears. And I mentioned something about bear hunting in the media, and then one, one newspaper picked it up, and another one, and it just tripped, and it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And soon I was doing like 50 interviews a day, which is crazy, it got out of control. I was doing everything from Chinese TV to <laughs> Turkish TV, it was, it, was, it was going all over, but. Um, so the issue of trophy hunting really started to blow up, and I remember I was in the Vancouver Art Gallery, 
And I was there doing a big display about spirit bears and, and their habitat location and all those kind of things. And then, um, so some whole bunch of people in media came to me and interviewed me about um, the bear hunt issue. And after I gave my answer and said, yeah, bear hunting is a real thing and it happens in the Great Bear, and these guys come and shoot up the sport. And, and then so after they finished doing an interview with me, they ran upstairs and then Barry Penner was upstairs. And he was the Minister of Environment and that's what the, that's what the hunt used to be managed under was the Minister, uh, was minister of Environment. And at that time, the minister said, well, listen, trophy hunting is based on sound science. He said it's based on um, economics that, uh, well, no, first of all, they said it's based on sound science and they have the best available science out there. They said it's based on economics, that trophy hunting is worth $350 million in the province of British Columbia. And they also said that the provincial government has increased all these protected areas on the British Columbia coast that are supposed to protect these bears. And I knew they were full of it. I knew none of those were true. Um, but I'm not a scientist and I couldn't go and prove all those things, so we had to go and tackle this issue and try and create a group that would go and tackle and debunk these issues because we just knew they were false. So we set up a group uh, on behalf of Coastal First Nations called the Central Coast Bear Working Group. Uh, through a lot of partnerships, we were able to go and, uh, uh, and gather the resources and start tackling these issues. And the issue when they say uh, that all these protected areas are supposed to protect bears uh, in the Great Bear Rainforest, there's only one conservancy in the Great Bear Rainforest that protect bears, and that's the Coos Mateen. Uh, essentially, there's some sort of form, or there's some form of bear hunting in all the areas, whether you can hunt black bears, uh, a lot of areas open up for grizzly bears, uh, so that was absolutely crazy that they, you know, say that these protected areas protect bears. So you can walk into any park or conservancy and go blast a bear in the Great Bear Rainforest. Um, and then they also said it was based on sound science. So we said, well, where's the, what are they talking about sound science? My time out there, uh, last 16 years, uh, as a tour guide, um, as a field technician with um, co-management, I've never seen a government scientist out there doing bear research. Uh, not once in all of my travels I've ever come across uh, seen any, any work out there. So I asked them, well, what's sound science? So that's through the partnerships of Raincoast, we were able to look at that and say, well, what are they talking about with the sound science? We found out very quickly that it was actually someone down here in Victoria looking at these computer habitat models and saying, well, here's so many trees there are, here's so many berry bushes, therefore this many bears that should be. And, uh, you know, they do flyovers of, of one or two systems in British Columbia and apply that, you know, through all, all British Columbia and say, this is, this is what the bear population is which is absolutely crazy and there's lots of gaps in the science. So from something really basic like decline in salmon, if you don't have the salmon there, you're gonna have a huge crash of the bear population. And I've seen this uh, several times throughout my career as a, as a guide. I've seen salmon just wiped out in some systems and you just watch all the bears just move on to other systems. Um, so I've seen it in, in my time. Um, so we said that wasn't enough. We had, as coastal communities, if the government wants to use science as an argument, well, we'll go battle science with science. We'll start doing science in our communities. So uh, that, through a partnership with the Rain Coast, has allowed us to do that and to have people like Christina Service come up to our communities and bring that expertise and, and get out there and start doing that science up there. And we have governments on the ground. So in the Central Coast, collectively, we spend about half a million dollars on bear research every year, um, just collecting all that data. We have hair snags in well over a hundred rivers in our territory um, and, and we partner this with all the other communities we're able to share all of our data and collect all the, the, bear, the bear research. And then the last one they said bear, uh, that trophy hunting was worth 350 million dollars for the province of British Columbia. And we said well wait a minute can you guys tell us what bears are worth in the Great Bear Rainforest? And they always go in the media and say bears are worth, uh, no they said hunt, trophy hunting is worth 350 million dollars for the province of British Columbia. So we said just tell us what bears are worth, they wouldn't do it. So this would never do that. So in all the response in the media, they always talk about trophy hunting, which includes all animals, from rabbits to moose to you know whatever. You know. So we said, fine, we gotta go find out what those numbers are. So we partnered with one group called Crest, and we also partnered with Stanford University. And we said, will you guys come up here and do an economic analysis? And tell us really what's going on up there. We're not having any influence. Here are the issues. And so they want to, uh, go look at, at some of the issues and they said, well Doug, we can't just look at, oh, we asked them to look at trophy hunting versus ecotourism operations or tourism on the coast. And they said, well, we have to include resident hunting as well. And we said, fine, so you know, go and do that. And, and so they went out and they, uh, here are the results. They basically said there's four, there's four guide outfitter companies in the Great Bear Rainforest that come up to our territory to shoot bears. They employ a total of 11 people and uh, both the trophy hunt and the resident hunt combined is worth $1.1 million. Um, 
and they said there's 56 ecotourism opera uh, operations, um, 56 ecotourism operations in the Great Bear Rainforest uh, that employ a total of 560 people. Um, and that was worth $15.2 million. The report also said that um, the provincial government actually spent more money <coughs> managing the hunt than they actually made on the hunt. So this whole economic argument to say that trophy hunting was a huge part of British Columbia's economy just didn't make any sense. So we blew all those numbers out of the water. They didn't have the sound science. These protected areas don't protect theirs. So uh, essentially, we're trying to create all these arguments to be able to end some of these issues. And I just don't think that science is there. And another really interesting thing is you know, the population estimates that, that are thrown out there to say that there's um, 17,000 grizzly bears, 30-something thousand black bears. Uh, we just don't know where they're getting those numbers. You know, I just don't think there's anything close to those kind of numbers. And through our bear research, we were able to track huge movements uh, of bears. Some bears would come uh, from my territory, you know, the top end of our territory, go all the way down to Bella Bella and come all the way back again. So it's huge movements of these bears. So uh, I just don't think there's as many as, uh, as you know, the estimates are standing. Um, and here's another issue on habitat protection. I know Chris kind of touched a bit on this as well. Um, but I remember I was sitting in my office one day and uh, the provincial government sent uh, you know, these, these habitat maps. So all these maps came across my desk that basically had, you know, the, the provincial government said this is all grizzly bear habitat and that was all on the island. And they had some areas they identified on the island. And as you know, the provincial government has a responsibility to look at protecting grizzly bear habitat, both level one and level two. Level one is supposed to protect 100% of the habitat and level two is supposed to protect 50% of the habitat. And after we went over all the data, we found that there was huge gaps in the data. And there was one river in particular, I remember this one, they said, this is the same river, really small system. Half the river is protected as level one, and the other half of the river is protected as level two. I'm like, this is the same freaking river. Bears sleep on both sides, so it didn't make any sense to me. Like, How does this make any sense? So, and then another thing is the province didn't have any data for grizzly bears on all these islands. So I made a phone call and I said, hey, Tony, there's lots of grizzly bears on the islands. You guys are missing huge chunks of data on the islands. And this is the response I got from the province was that, um, well, you know, what, well, they, no, first of all, they said, there's, um, those are probably just male bears, male grizzly bears probably just passing through. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, I've been watching these bears for the last maybe six or seven years in the territory. These are mothers with cubs, you know. And they said, well, what evidence do you have of this? And I said, oh, I got videos, I got GPS, I got photos. I said, what do you want? I'll send it all over. And they said, you know, well, Doug, you know, there's some people that mix up grizzly bears and black bears. And like, this is what I do for a living. And I think I can tell the difference between a black bear and a grizzly bear. So I was shocked. And then the next answer was that, you know, Doug, you're not a scientist or a biologist, and you can't be making these sort of allegations. And I just, I was crushed to think that, here I am as a tour guide, I can see these things, I know they're there, I can smell the bears, I know exactly what's there, but, you know, just there's no credibility in that arena to say that these bears are there, which is absolutely crazy. So, um, we said, well, what do we got to do to start proving that these bears are there? And that's why, you know, to me that discussion wasn't going anywhere, so that's through the relationships with Raincoats, it allowed us to get out there and collect all this fur, do all that analysis. <coughs> And now we've been doing this for five years, we're on the fifth year now, um, and uh, you know we have a ton of data. And we have proved that there is tons of grizzly bears on all these islands, and we're able to go back to the province and say, well, listen, there are grizzly bears there. We have remote cameras, and you know, a lot of these systems, uh, you know, we have the barbed wire that's collecting the fur, we're doing all the DNA analysis, genetics, uh, you know, through here in Victoria, this is through UVic. Um, and that was huge, so to be able to bring that. But those are just some of the, the, the challenges that we have in terms of you know, trying to do that. But through this work and through the partnership now has really allowed us to go back to the table and say, well, listen, let's go back and have a, a different discussion about uh, identifying bear habitat. And yeah, let's not forget the islands and have all those islands. So that's been really important as well. Um, and just one of the other major issues is just there's not a, there's a, a very little monitoring enforcement from the province when it comes to a lot of these issues. I don't know that when we developed our land use plan back in the day, um, and, and you know, I would say probably 15, 20 years ago, we used to see, we used to see a lot of illegal activities happen in our territory. Uh, we used to see a lot of people come in, and, and it was a lot of poaching of bears. People used to come in, whether it was taking gallbladders. Um, and I remember one time we found a dead bear up in one of our rivers floating in the river, and his paws were gone, his gallbladder was gone, and his head was gone. So, um, and I remember, uh, you know, so the, the community said, 
as we started to build these plans, that Doug, we need to have a presence up there. You know, we can't just talk about building land use plans, marine use plans. We can't talk about developing conservancy <coughs> management plans. None of this means anything if you don't if you don't have monitoring and enforcement. So that's really important. So go and find some way of getting a presence up there because my community said you just don't see BC parks up there. You don't see DFO up there. So get up there and do something about it. So. That's when we started to build our watchman program. This is our, our watchman program, which is men and women from our communities that are hired to get up there and monitor and patrol the territory. So I just want to show you, this is 2014, um, and it's a bit blurry, but basically you can see this, this line is, um, you, you get a bit, you know, they come out 10 days in 2014, and that's probably the most we've seen probably in the last 15 years. So 10 days of the whole season, the whole, whole year, uh, they get up there and monitor and patrol the areas. So our, our Washington program, when we created this program, we spend about $150,000 on our program every year, and our guys out there every day. So we put a GPS tracker on the boat that tracks every movement of all of our coastal running Washington to get out there and monitor and patrol these areas. Um, and that was really important. So the illegal poaching has really fallen off the map. So we just don't see that in our community anymore. And we've also banned trophy hunting in the Great Bear Rainforest. So it's an alliance of all of our communities. We said, we don't care what the provincial regulations are on trophy hunting, it's banned. If you want to come here to hunt, it's not going to happen. So we try to get that message out there loud and clear. Uh, to trophy hunters, to the provincial government, that trophy hunting is not going to happen, and we'll do whatever it takes to make sure it doesn't happen. Um, and so, again, we're continuing to enforce that. We continue to work very hard, um, whether it's taking all the best available science and all the information we have, taking that to the government-to-government -to -government tables to make sure that we can end um, you know, practices like trophy hunting. Uh, and then next, the resident hunt, which feels uh, but you know, a really important thing for us is we want to make sure that um, we were collecting the research, and that was a huge part. And, um, this was really challenging in our community because my community didn't really trust a lot of science, and uh, especially some of our elders, because in their time, science was always used against the community, and they watched people come in and over harvest and take everything out of the territory. Still, like today, you will not get, we're not allowed to touch abalone. That's something that was a once abundant resource, but uh, after it went to commercial operations, uh, it's been wiped out. And that was all based on sound science, saying you can take a certain percentage without affecting the overall population, but now they've been impacted so much that they just haven't been able to come back. So, trying to get, especially some of my elders in my community, to say that, you know, we have to go fight science with science has is, is, is been very challenging, but now they're starting to see the value of it and starting to see what sort of influence we have because. Those days are over where communities can just go bang on the table and say something's got to change and we've got to do something about it. So these partnerships has allowed us to bring science to the tables and allow us to do that. Um, and through all of our partnerships, whether we're working with Raincoast, and I know part of the job with Christina is to say that you have to work with our local community, to say that you have to take local community people up there and go um, and train some of our local members to make sure that you know those skills stay there and hopefully will help inspire a new generation of scientists in our community that will get up there and do some of that research or continue that research up there. So that's been really important. But essentially that's why we created the Spearberg Research Foundation. And, and Spearberg Research Foundation, um, again, we try to focus a bit more on holistic view of management, not just look at one particular thing. Uh, again, we want to do research on salmon, on bears, on their habitat mixture, all those are all protected. So that was really important for us. But we also want to make sure all the other pieces are fitting in there as well. Again, to make sure that the capacity is being built in the communities, having young people grow up and, and, and they can get out there and do some of this work, to make sure that the Coastal Guard and Washington programs are out there enforcing all of these things, and to make sure that we protect the, you know, the values uh, and protect all the, the habitat for all the bears and for hopefully all British Columbians and Canadians and a lot of people from around the world that want to come and see uh, what we have. So. And I guess I just want to end it, you know, my community has always said all throughout our plans, land use planning, marine use planning, whatever it is, they have always said, Doug, you know, this, if you take care of the land, the land will take care of you. And that was always really important. And um, that's something that the, the elders always stressed and it's written through our plans, it's passed on to the next young generation. And I think that's all of our responsibility. And I think it doesn't matter whether you're First Nations or non-First Nations, whether you're a scientist or not a scientist, you know, I think just the way things are going now, I just think that you know we all have to start uh, standing up and doing something. And, and you know we look forward to partnering with us with scientists and, and doing some of this work, and, and again taking that science to the government to government tables and start changing some of these policies that are out there because some of them are outdated and uh, and just need to change. So um, I think with that said, that's all I have to say. I can go on a million different subjects, but uh, maybe I'll just leave it open for any for any questions. So, thank you.